The title says it all. We need to talk about another Tier 0 deck that is just the most powerful of all time. Unlike you, unlike you, I'm talking to you, you have less of a catch rate than a Great Ball in Gen 1. That's a real fact, actually. It's been a while since we bust you out. He looks like he's a little furry and chubby and very squishy. He is not hard. We aren't hard either. Also, if I sound like I'm yelling, I'm sorry, because my ears are ringing, because I went and saw Broadway play that had terrible sound. <laughs> I can't hear a thing. Let's dive on into it, shall we? I'm having a good hair day. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, it is your host with the most, Avery LR32, your run. Destroy the ever-living boo-boo, staying off that like and subscribe button, as well as that ding-dong Taco Bell notification bell, as we climb even higher, the 1400 ladder. Thank you all so much for all the support in the last couple of videos. I don't know if the algorithm is just finally working in my favor or what, but I've decided to make some longer discussion videos, and after trying to write a script for this video, like, God, five times... Uh, I feel like it's better as just like a typical discussion that is a bit longer than our normal discussion. So sit back, get your coffee, get your beer, get your wine, get your seat comfy on the toilet if you're watching this while taking a dump. It's okay, I do it too. <laughs> and let's talk about why Tier Element is the deck of all time, as the title says. Now, what do I mean by the deck of all time? Tier Element came out in Power of the Elements along with Sprite and all that other good stuff, right? And it was a Tier 1 deck out of the gate. We saw different variations of Tier Element back when this came out in 2022, being played with, like, Danger cards. We had Danger Tier Element. I believe we also had Danger Sprite Tier Element. And then we also had, of course, just Sprite Tier Element, of course, using Sprite Elf because Sprite Elf was so powerful. What was it, though, that really pushed Tier Element over the edge to make it Tier 0? Maybe you weren't playing in this format, which, God, you dodged a bullet. But it was the fact that Magnificent Mavens came out and we got Aigido, Kelbeck, Keldeo, and Medora. Aigido and Kelbeck, of course, being the millers that would, when they're sent to grave, mill five cards. Keldeo and Medora being able to shuffle back any three cards, up to three cards from either graveyard. And if you had exchanged the spirit face upon your field or in your grave, you could do five cards instead. And what was crazy about Tier Element is the fact that, of course, we had things like Tier Element Hoff Fennis, Merle, and Sharon that were all at three, because, of course, they're a full power, that could fuse from the graveyard and put themselves back into the deck. It, it was absolutely insane, right? And what was crazy is that you had all of these different variations. The deck was constantly improving. And I would argue it... Well, actually, I, I would just pretty much prove that it's just the most powerful Yu-Gi-Oh deck of all time, that we saw it's the most powerful Tier 0 deck ever. And the reason why this is such a big thing uh, to come across, first time ever in the game, is because when you look at these other Tier 0 decks in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, which I've been playing for 16 years, this December will be 17 years I've been playing competitively, um, you look at these other Tier 0 decks, and there is a, even though that there's power creep, there is a... Uh, a somewhat amount of viability and uh, what's the word? Not discrepancy, but essentially they can go toe to toe to a degree. Uh, one of the examples I was thinking of earlier today actually was 2013 Dragon Rulers at full power against the Yada Lock Chaos Emperor Dragon the deck. For those of you who aren't familiar with that, it's basically from like 2004. Where Chaos Emperor Dragon, obviously pre errata, uh, you would drop out Chaos Emperor Dragon, you would nuke the board, have either a Sangin or a Witch of the Black Forest on your field, so that when your board got nuked, you could trigger the Sangin of the Witch, add Yada Garasa to your hand, normal summon the Yada, poke for 300, activate the Yada's effect, now the opponent can't draw, you have them in a lock, right? And I would argue that if you took 2013 Dragon Rulers, like with Vanity's Emptiness, whatever, all the Dragon Rulers at three planes, Super Rejuvenation, whatever, it would be a bit of a dice roll, I think. Um, but. I feel like that those two decks could go head to head. CED with Yada against 2013 Dragon Rulers. They're both tier zero from their own eras. I feel like that they could somewhat go toe to toe to a degree. Would it be a bit of a dice roll? Yes. Especially if you look at more like the tier zero decks or even just tier one decks that were FTKs that were super consistent, like Frog FTK, Magical Scientist FTK. Those are very much dice rolls because if you don't open up any hand traps and you're playing like a more modern tier zero ish deck, whether it's Spiral, Tier, Snake Eyes, of course, what have you, then obviously you're going to have hand traps to stop whatever kind of FTK deck the opponent may be playing. And so when you look at something like Tier Element, 
it's so insane to see that you could pit it against any other deck, even decks that are out right now, and it's better than. So, like, even if you took, maybe a better example would be, like, 2004 Chaos Ember Dragon with Yada Lock, whatever, and pit it against, say, a deck that came out four years later in 2008, uh, Dark Arm Return, before it became Teledad with the release of Synchros, right? I would say that those decks would be more uh, competitive against each other than, say, like, 2013 Dragon Rulers with 2004 CED Yada Lock. But you take 2022 Full Power Post Magnificent Mavens Tier Elements into Tier 0 Snake Eyes, and I actually asked some of my friends about this. I said, what do you think is stronger? And they're like, Tier Element all day. Because Tier Element, the power creep on that deck is still, even two years removed now, is so insanely high. And their end boards, when you look at an end board in Yu-Gi-Oh!, typically you can see like, okay, here's the choke point for this. Here's what you should hand trap or what you should negate, right? But Tier Element's boards were so malleable. They were so different because it was pretty much all but confirmed because, I mean, you're a milling deck. You're not going to open the same five cards every game. You're not going to mill the same cards every game, whether it's you just mill five, you mill 10, you mill 20, you know, whatever, right? So your end board is going to look very different every single time. Obviously, you have things that you want to shoot for in that end board, whether it was, you know, making a kick Kalos when, before it was banned, of course, to then go into Rue Kalos or, you know, having your end board be like Rue Kalos, Dweller, Time Thief, Redoer. Your end board would just depend on whatever your matchup was. You know, if it was a mirror match, then ideally you'd want to make a Dweller before popping off with all your plays so that the tier player just can't play. Uh, even just to get you to the next turn in case you didn't open all that well, at least the tier player really couldn't play all that well. Um, you know, whether Boral Load Savage and Baron are in the game or not, right? Because the deck has just continued to evolve with the release of other things, which makes the deck tier two, but because of all the hits, it's not as consistent, right? We're talking full power here. And so when you're trying to stop tier, I remember Pure Sprite was having to play 12 to 15 hand traps just to keep up with tier. I remember talking about it here on the channel. I remember dunking on the Dark World structure deck that was coming out at the time, and it got thousands of views. It was actually really funny. And I'm like, look, why are you going to buy this structure deck when tier element is tier zero? Because you're going to take this structure deck, you're going to go to your locals, you're going to get crapped on by the tier player. And then little Timmy's going to look around the room and be like, this format sucks, I'm going home. And then like they just never play again, right? So it, it just wasn't a fun time. You also had access to the rank 4 toolbox of Exceeds, which is so insane. Whether they're banned or not, the rank 4 Exceeds toolbox has always been insane. Whether it was number 16 Shockmaster, I remember playing with windups back in the day. Lava Will Chain was crazy in Infernity. Um, Time Thief Redoer, Abyss Dweller, you name it. Uh, tier element had access to that package they had access to incredible fusions in archetype or not if they played shadal cards suddenly they can make a window um if they played i don't know anaconda if it was legal at the time and they could go for like a dpe or just whatever it was that they wanted to play they were just so deadly consistent and it was actually funny because back then i remember playing my dad on dueling nexus and i was testing tier and i was testing an ocg build that actually played exchange of the spirit I activated Exchange of the Spirit and I made the Dueling Nexus server crash. Like I literally got a blue screen. I remember showing it on the channel. It was hilarious. And that's obviously more of a Dueling Nexus issue, but it was hilarious that Dueling Nexus didn't even go as far to try and program Exchange of the Spirit because they just probably knew that the card was toxic, which is something else that not a lot of people talked about here in the TCG because it didn't really pop off compared to the OCG, that if you like milled an Aigido and you had Exchange of the Spirit face up or in your grave, you got to mill five more cards. So one card is milling you 10. That's more than even what like Needle Bug Nest can do, which just mills five cards from your deck. Like that's insane. Kelbeck allowing you to set a trap if you've got um, Exchange of the Spirit face up on the field or in the graveyard. Keldo Medora being able to shuffle back five cards instead of three if Exchange of the Spirit was face up on your field or in your grave. If you timed it right, what the OCG was doing was that you got the opponent down to five cards, you activate Exchange of the Spirit, you mill an Aigido, uh, through like I guess swapping the decks or if you had a way to mill and then you just mill the last five cards in their deck with another copy by Guido it was absolutely insane obviously that didn't take off here in the TCG but it was just something hilarious that you could do with the deck and it was just so absolutely toxic I remember even playing a runic deck that played uh reasoning with the uh, Shizu cards because you didn't mind having runic spells in the grave because you could just fountain them back. So it was like, you're either going to hit runic spells off of the reasoning, or you're going to hit maybe like an Aigido or a Kelbeck if they call level four, it's going to go to grave, you're going to mill cards anyway, it's going to be a good time. 
there was a specific Reddit post I was trying to find. It was not this one I'm about to read you, but they really, they essentially talk about everything that I mentioned and I really want to talk about in this video, but I can't find it. But I did find one here when someone was asking on Reddit, what makes tier element so good? And I think that this person really uh, explains it very well, honestly, better than I could ever, you know, make into a script, like what I was originally, originally trying to do with this video. So I'm going to read this to you. And then we're going to kind of talk about it. Milling in Yu-Gi-Oh! is just naturally strong since we have payoff that extends beyond simply recycling and rescuing, or recurring them, excuse me. Any card that has an active effect in Grave basically reads as an extra draw. To easier understand, to, to easier understand tier element, this person must not know English, you kind of need to go back to Duelist Alliance. The set was impactful, but to summarize, Duelist Alliance made it so that stuff just floats, making it damn near impossible to play value against them. This is true. One of the strongest archetypes in Duelist Alliance was Burning Abyss, the single most successful Yu-Gi-Oh deck of all time. I would argue that that's true. And at worst, the second best archetype from that set. That is true. Burning Abyss all have an effect to be cheated onto the field and another that is activated when they are sent to the graveyard. To balance this, they can't use their first and second effects in the same turn. You have to choose whether you cheat them out or they float. The only card in the deck that can activate their effect is Dante, and they blow themselves up if you aren't running burn if you're running non-burning abyss cards. So you had to play all archetype cards. The only interactive card in the archetype is Farfa, and it took multiple multiple baneless and years before they got Beatrice that finally let you use Farfa as an actual destructive tool. Despite this, the deck was good enough. It gets mixed with all sorts of stuff. Tier element is that, but unrestricted and on crack with one extra. Every tier element is effectively BAs, can be cheated floats, but they also mill. Their on mill effect are much less tame. Seer simply revives one monster from the graveyard. Tier straight up does a fusion summon. Tier element in archetype mill effect was summoning a boss monster that disrupts you. Also, you need to kill them twice if you beat them outside of battle. Because remember, tier element had the effects that like, especially the fusions, if they're sent to the graveyard, you can just revive them. So like it made board breakers completely useless, whereas you could at least use them to kind of tame other decks boards. And finally, Hoffenis is rather unique in that it's a hand trap, but while hand traps usually just do one extremely strong one-off effect, Hoffenis is a hand trap that does plays. Yes, technically Hoffenis into a into a Rukalos is just one pop, just like how a hand trap is one interaction, but that's still a lingering body that can punch you in the fact in the face on top of whatever follow-up Hoffenis sets up along the way. On top of this, the archetype lacks restriction. Mill generally being an extremely fluid mechanic and you get extras like using their dark attribute to enable stuff. For example, by Steel Druid Swarm can be summoned by banishing one of your many tier elements, which puts up a 2500 wall that can take out one monster on the field when you're trying to go for game. The Ashizu cards further up the ante by playing and disrupting their mill heavy playstyle and also giving you a level four fodder to convert into Link or Xyz plays. Yes, they give the image of being a gamble deck, but think about it this way. Which is more consistent? Drawing, say, one of 10 cards out of a five card draw, 10 cards being what you need to make a play with a standard deck, five being part of the normal draw, or one of 10 cards out of 10 plus mills. So you weren't locked into anything. The tier elements were very splashable. You had in hand trap, in archetype hand traps in the form of Hoffenis. And even if you were playing a deck like Flunder or even Sprite to a degree that could play Dimension Shifter, you had a 22% chance that the shifter wasn't going to work because remember, Aigido, Kelbeck, Keldo, Medora were all fucking fairies. So they played Herald of Orange Light at three. So now if you tried to shifter them, maybe that wouldn't even work, Sugar Boo Bear. And then you're really crapping your pants all over your locals or your regional or YCS venue floor because now the tier player is just going to pop off and you have to sit there in a say a feature match and watch them go to chain link 14 i still don't understand why people think tier element mirror matches are fun to watch They're going to chain link 14 and having to watch all that resolve no i would rather honestly i kid you not i'd rather watch a snake eye mirror because at least then i can kind of get up a bit of a laugh when chris leblanc goes activate skill drain and his opponent chains cross out call skill drain feels bad if you're involved in that but really funny if you're watching it i would argue so to summarize all this up, I'm actually not going to turn that off yet. I need that screen for light. But to summarize all this up, could tier element still be a tier zero deck today if it was at full power? Absolutely. And the reason why this is a surprise is because maybe we'll see it in like another few years. But as time goes on, you can see where these other tier zero decks could come back to full power and not be all that good. Like... If we saw Dragon Rulers come back to full power with like three of every Dragon Ruler, 
I would argue that Vanity's Emptiness is maybe still a little bit too good. But every Dragon Ruler at three, I don't think would be all that great of a deck. Sure, Dragon Link would get a lot better. But just as a pure strategy, like if you took your 2013 Dragon Ruler deck and tried to play it all over again, I don't think you would see as much success in the modern game as you did back in the day. Obviously, there are other things that have been banned from the deck like Vandy's Emptiness, but you get my point. The, the core fundamentals of the deck back at full power. I just don't think you would see success. Same thing if you took like a Teledad deck at full power. Uh, obviously, Crush Card has had an errata, but again, the core concept, the core mechanics of the deck, I just don't think are really it anymore. I don't think you're going to have a good stuff pile deck like Teledad, Chaos, Yada Lock, Hand Control, Beatdown. Uh, like, I don't think you're going to see those days where like back in Teledad, you were activating a Destiny draw to ditch a Mally draw to and just get instant advantage because the Destiny draw, if like you drew into a Plague Spreader or you opened with it, it became a one-card Stardust Dragon. You just banish the Mally, summon it, summon the Plague Spreader, make a Stardust. Now, like, the opponent's going to laugh in your face if you're ending on a Stardust Dragon, whereas back in the day, that was mighty powerful. So, I don't ever want to see Tier Element come back to full power, but when you're looking, the number one thing to take away from all this, when you're looking at these new decks coming out, or if another deck, say, in a couple years, becomes Tier 0, and we say, oh, it's Snake Eyes 2.0, Ask yourself this, which can really determine how powerful a Tier 0 deck is. And when we get another Tier Elements-esque Tier 0 deck, you'll know it's Tier Element level. Because people are going to say, this is stronger than Tier Element. So at the end of the day, does Snake Eye format suck? Absolutely. Should it be hit? Absolutely. But, I will say this. At least, it's not Tier Element. Because Tier Element at full power can decimate any other deck in the game's history even today. So guys, let me know what you think down in the comments below. Let me know what you think about all this. I'd really love to know what y'all think. Did you play in tier element format? Did you not? Are you glad that you dodged a bullet? Did you have fun in that format? I personally really didn't care. And we didn't even talk about how like near the end of their reign, they started playing the cash tier cards because those just those had just come out in Photon Hypernova. So people started playing tier element cash tier. I didn't really want to talk about that in this video, although I guess now I am. But that was near the end of their reign. And then we got the balance that really reeled them in. So it didn't really have a chance to take off. And I don't think anybody really wanted to deal with that anyway, especially with cash tier or rise heart being in Photon Hypernova. And we had to deal with that. So guys, let me know what you think about all this and more down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.